Yeah, send me the uh, send me the recording later. Yeah, we will. We have a, a YouTube channel, so I would Good. send the perfect link later. Okay, so um, uh, thank you to uh, to join this uh, call. And uh, my name is uh, Giovanni Santostasi, uh, and uh, you know, I am the CEO and Chief Scientific Officer of this company. We are located here in uh, San Diego, Deep Wave Technologies. And uh, uh, what I'm going to talk today about is about this, our main technology, that is basically this uh, system that we develop uh, that uh, uh, is able to detect uh, using very little information, that is basically, uh, we are using a wearable device um, that uh, is one main channel, right? Of course, it has reference, etc. But uh, it's a uh, one main channel uh, on the forehead, uh, and uh, we detect uh, um, the different stages of sleep. And then uh, during a slow sleep, that is uh, where our focus is, uh, we actually um, have an algorithm uh, that is uh, following the, um, the waves, the uh, slow waves. Man delivers uh, non-invasive uh, type of stimulation, which is uh, a burst of sound. Uh, it's a 50 milliseconds sound uh, with the goal of enhancing the amplitude of the waves themselves. Uh, because uh, uh, there, are, there is a lot of theory behind it, but uh, also from our uh, practical experimentation, uh, a lot of the benefits of uh, slow sleep are associated with the amplitude uh, of the waves themselves. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but uh, uh, that is one of the main things we are trying to do with this system. And uh, uh, together you know, uh, with uh, the amplification of the uh, waves, then we see um, some of the benefits of sleep that are uh, a lot, uh, but our main focus is on uh, this process that is called memory consolidation. Uh, we see an improvement in uh, some aspects of memory, for example, word recall. Um, we give some, some of these classical tests and we see then that uh, uh, people uh, behavior changes, you know, their uh, memory uh, performance improves uh, and is uh, uh, correlated with uh, the improvement in the amplitude of the waves. So that, that is kind of in a summary what uh, I'm going to talk uh, uh, in this presentation. But uh, bef before we do that, uh, uh, I'm not sure uh, um, what is the background knowledge that people have about sleep. So if you don't mind, um, you know, I'm going to assume that you have a, because I, I noticed that even amongst neuroscientists, you know, that you have a some general understanding, but uh, everybody specializes, right? And so maybe you're not familiar with all the aspects of sleep. So if you don't mind, I would, would like to give you a small introduction about that. Uh, so first of all, it's very interesting, uh, you know, here I, I was trying to joke, say, you know, it's an incredible market opportunity because absolutely everybody sleeps, right? So it's a huge market. Uh, but uh, if you're thinking as a company, but even, you know, from a research point of view, it's very fascinating that uh, uh, a lot of different organisms sleep, right? So in these slides, actually, I'm trying to say that basically uh, all the organisms sleep, even in a sense, even uh, unicellular organisms sleep, um, you know, because we have a, you cannot say that it's complex as the sleep of humans, but, you know, you still have uh, active times and uh, non-active times. So in, you can call it, quote, unquote, sleep in a sense. Uh, but this is a big question in the field because, uh, you know, it could be kind of a guiding uh light uh, in trying to explore this field. Why, why do we sleep, right? And why do we spend so much time uh, doing this thing? That is, uh, uh, at least from outside, it doesn't look very useful, right? For, uh, for the organism, you are, uh, you are off, you could be um, susceptible to prey, to be in a prey, you know, to be predated. Uh, and because you're inactive, you know, you don't monitor the environment. So it's actually something that uh, a lot of people in the field use as a, as a pre, almost like a guiding principle, you know, trying to understand this question, why do we sleep at all? Uh, it's actually also useful in terms of, later I will, I will try to explain you, um, it's just a theory you now, why our intervention works. And it's kind of related to this question of 
why we sleep at all, right? Or at least up in, in, a, in a sad way, you know, because uh, yes, we need to sleep because it's important. It does all these different important things, but also you, want, you don't want to be completely off like you know this picture looks like you don't you still want to have some level of monitoring of the environment and this is actually uh, keep, keep in mind this i think i just said because it will be something that we will discuss a lot later to understand why the stimulation works um anyway so one of the main things that uh, uh we use as a tool in uh, uh in, in understanding sleep it's uh, you know first of all the main um, useful tool is is uh, is very uh, eg right so we that is the uh, there are the things that you can do of course you can observe the per the subject sleeping you know with cameras or the things you know you can measure oxygen levels you can do a lot of different type of use a lot of different type of sensor like in this uh, picture here but uh, it, the eg remains the golden standard you know this when is the uh, main uh, type of information that allows us to study and uh, understand sleep. Um, when when uh, we uh, monitor sleep, you know, during it's you know we know that it's about seven hours, right? Seven to eight hours. That is the typical amount we spend uh, sleeping. Um, we can uh, record all these different type of. Uh, you know, they are called waves. I think of waves is a misnomer, but you know, that is the ten, uh, terminology. They have different type uh, of uh, uh, range of uh, frequencies uh, that are typical of the different stages of sleep. So first of all, um, we divide sleep in two main sections. One is called REM sleep, and the other one is called non-REM. That is mostly for historical reason, not because REM is more important than non-REM. So the people that specialize like me in non-REM, uh, we are a little bit upset about, you know, calling it non-REM because it looks like, oh, okay, there is REM and then there is everything else, you know, like it is not important. But uh, actually non-REM is as important, if not more important than REM. But bo both, uh, both type of sleeps are actually uh, very essential and this is why they are both present and they follow each other. Um, so first of all, you can identify them by uh, roughly, right, by uh, the range of frequencies. Uh, so first of all, during, uh, a, a, when you're awake, uh, most of the waves are beta waves. And that, uh, you know, you probably are very familiar with that. It's in, in sleep, we we'll use our own definition of what these waves are, but, you know, they go all the way to 30 hertz. Um, and uh, so you can see there are, in this uh, graphical representation, they are relatively uh, small in amplitude and very fast, right? And they are small in amplitude uh, probably because uh, uh, there are many different parts of the brains that are, acti that are acting uh, uh, independently. So even if maybe the amplitude of uh, each uh, active uh, re brain region are relatively high, when you're looking at everything from the skull, these waves cancel each other. Uh, they are not coherent, and so they look small. Um, and so as you go uh, deep, so as you fall asleep, you start with you know this drowsy uh, sensation that everybody's familiar. But uh, when you close your eyes, you start to have a, a little bit uh, uh, a higher in amplitude. So that is the main thing. As you go to uh, go deeper in sleep, the amplitude becomes bigger and the waves became slower, right? So you now, uh, as you close your eyes, uh, uh, you're not still sleeping, but the alpha waves dominate. Then uh, as you reach uh, uh, this uh, non-REM, so this N means non-REM, uh, and there are three main stages, N1, N2, and N3, where uh, uh, you know, the bigger the number, deeper the sleep. And you can see what happens, right? Uh, so you start to have uh, theta waves, then, uh, you start to see more delta activity. Uh, together with the, the delta activity in N2, you start to see also these uh, particular features uh, that are called spindles. Um, these are a little bit higher frequency. They go from nine to 16 Hertz and they call spindles because of the growing amplitude, they reach a maximum and then they decrease. So they, they have a shape of a spindle. 
uh, and that's every uh, every feature has a particular purpose that we will discuss uh, in a moment. Then, as you go to uh, deep sleep, uh, that is an entry. Uh, we call it deep sleep or uh, slow wave sleep because you know these big waves are slower relatively to the beta, for example. So we are talking about typically a range between zero and four hertz, uh, but you know, the typical slow wave is about one second. Um, then uh, you have RAM where, uh, you know, you, you, you probably know that, and that, I don't know if you, you know this thing, but if, when RAM was also called initially when it was discovered, paradoxical sleep, right? It's paradoxical because you see the person sleeping, and then you see these uh, rapid eyes movements, um, you know, that are uh, pretty noticeable, uh, and then uh, they, they wave themselves. Uh, they are not quite looking like uh, when you're awake, but uh, they are much smaller in amplitude and faster. Uh, and so they are distinguishable from uh, awake, but uh, at uh, first glance, they look almost like you're uh, awake. So they are very different from non-REM. Uh, and uh, you know that it's indicative of uh, more activity uh, in the brain. Um, you know, in fact, you know we have some level of awareness. We are uh, dreaming, right? Uh, most of the dream actually happens during REM, uh, and uh, we still experience things. Our brain is uh, processing internal information. Uh, we use all these uh, brain waves then to create a, what is called an hippogram. Uh, so it's a graph like this, um, where uh, basically uh, you have on the x-axis the time. Uh, here is the reporting in terms of hours of sleep. And then uh, you divide uh, in the y-axis, you divide this time in terms of uh, uh, wh which stage the subject is in. Yeah, this graph, I, I should change it eventually in, in these slides because it's uh, kind of incorrect. You don't drop immediately to entry. Uh, it's kind of almost like the reverse of uh, this part here where uh, as you go away from uh, entry, uh, you have all the different stages. So, so same thing, like you start from uh, you know, awake, then you go to N1, N2, N3, you stay there in entry. Then as you, you spend some time, uh, maybe like, you know, let's say 40 minutes, 50 minutes uh, in the early part of the night, and then you go back uh, out uh, through all these other uh, non-REM stages, and then you go to REM and you spend some time there. So these are called sleep cycles, typically are about 90 minutes each. And they, and you know one of the things that was very interesting for me as a physicist that when I enter the, this field is that uh, there are these very predictable patterns. It's probably one of the most predictable, one of the most uh, easy to study in terms of uh, mathematical or statistical characterization because it's, it's very regular. Um, like, you know, for example, if you compare these uh, sleep cycles between different individuals, they are con pretty consistent from night to night. Um, it's almost like a phenotype in a certain sense. Um, anyway, so one, one thing to notice here is this a very typical uh, pattern where uh, most of the slow, slow sleep happen early in the night. And, uh, and you can see the uh, duration of the RAM component of the cycle is actually shorter at uh, the beginning of the night. And as you go, uh, as you, the night progresses, uh, you actually stop having deep sleep uh, or you have a very, very short slow sleep. Uh, and you still have the other non-REM stages, uh, but um, the RAM becomes longer and longer. So this is very typical that happens uh, to everybody. Um, anyway, so um, I, I have some extra slides. We, we don't need to go through all of them, but you know, basically it's also interesting to study uh, how sleep uh, uh, falls into the circadian rhythms. Uh, and the interplay between uh, different type of drives uh, that make us to sleep. Um, so here is another sl sl slide where you can see a little bit better uh, the typical 
uh, features and, and structures of the uh, of how the EG looks like in the different stages. You can see how it should be relatively easy uh, to train an algorithm, right? To get identify using a combination of amplitude, frequencies, and maybe even feature uh, detection, like these sleep spindles, to actually then train uh, a system to recognize, you know, in live. It's it's not trivial, um, in particular if you are trying to do with a one single channel. But uh, you know, you, you can see how that it can be done because it really look different. Uh, you know, you can. Do, on, you know, a, a trained eye can do it uh, even just by looking at the screen. You can say, oh, yes, this is the subject. You know, if you monitor somebody sleeping, the, the subject is in stage one, stage two, and, and so on. Uh, for a time, uh, uh, people were subdividing. So they sleep in two stages, like three and four, but uh, uh, people settled on just calling all these uh, stage three. Um, some some old sources still mention three and four. Um, anyway, so uh, yeah, this is another picture where you can see a little bit better the structure of the spindle, uh, the delta waves. You know, the, so the, the slow waves per se they are very sharp. Uh, you know, they uh, they look almost you know they look like a V and then an inverted V, um, and uh, so. Uh, and even when you have uh, delta waves, you will see some delta TVT, and then you will see these huge big events. Uh, they can be like in young people; they can go all the way to 200 uh, microvolts. Like the, you know, the typical awake uh, amplitude is maybe like what 10 microvolts. Uh, in a in a young person, when you observe, it's really amazing to if you never saw them before to see these huge big events where you see 200 microvolts uh, uh, feature, in particular in women and young people. Uh, as as uh, uh, you age, these, uh, the amplitude of these waves actually goes down. That is a very interesting thing. It, and it, it almost it can be used as a, a biological age, age um, marker. Um, okay, and when you are in REM sleep, uh, you also can uh, divide RAM into phases, one with the, as these very typical eye movements. Uh, they are a little bit uh, slower, you know, the, the typical theta and beta that you see during uh, RAM. Uh, and uh, so there is a part of the RAM where you don't see these eye movements and, there, and uh, another section of the RAM where I, you see a lot of these eye movements. Different brain regions are responsible for uh, for these uh, brain waves, uh, but uh, I wanted to focus on uh, this particular process that happens during uh, slow sleep. So basically, it's, uh, when uh, we are in uh, slow sleep, uh, we have this kind of um, orchestration between three different reg regions of the brain. Uh, one is uh, the hippocampus. Uh, the other is the cortex, and then there is the thalamus. Here it says cortex too, but it's really the, the thalamus. Uh, and uh, so there are many different things that are happening during slow sleep. Uh, and uh, um, you know, there are a lot of important regulation processes, uh, like uh, the regulation of hormones, uh, uh, metabolism, uh, the resetting uh, of the immune system. But uh, one of the most studied phenomena that uh, was uh, um, it's about, I think, 10, 15 years that uh, this association between slow sleep and memory has been uh, studied and discovered. One of the earlier uh, scholars in this field is Professor Steve Golds at um, uh, Harvard University. And he, he was a pioneer where he, he did uh, a lot of interesting experiments uh, one of them was uh, um, it's kind of a, the golden standard in this field. So imagine I give you a memory test and I do this memory test uh, in the morning. So I, and uh, the typical memory test could be uh, I show you some words on a screen, um, you know, like it's a pair of words. This is what we typically use. 
uh, or you know, theater actor, for example, you know, and I show you 220 of these peers, uh, and they come to the screen for a couple of seconds. You have to look at them, and there is another couple, another couple, and you have to remember the association. And then the test consists of prompting you with uh, the first word, and then you have to say the second. So if I say theater, you will have to say actor, right? And they give you a point for each word that uh, you recalled correctly. So if you give this typical test during the day, uh, let's say you come eight in the morning, uh, and then eight hours later, so you do, you do the test, you get scored, uh, and then eight hours later, I test you again. Uh, you do your things, you know, you go to work, you do your uh, normal daily activity, and then you come back and you get scored again. So if you don't give, if I don't give you an opportunity to study again this word, that to re, you know to rehearse them or repeat them, etc., to look them again, most most people will forget. So and there is a, actually a very typical you can measure it. It's a, a kind of an, uh, an exponential decay according to how long, uh, how much time is passed from when you learn these words. Um, so very, very, you are going to forget. But if I give you this test in the evening, uh, and then I give, I give the same amount of time, this why eight hours, because it's the typical amount of time we spend in, uh, during sleep. If, I, if you sleep in these eight hours, you are actually going to remember better. So you will actually score a higher score than what, what you did just after uh, learning these words. And so this seems paradoxical because right the same amount is passed by. You were not doing anything, apparently. I mean, from outside, but actually you did something. Your brain was rehearsing this information. So this process, and uh, you know, and, and has been studied. There are thousands of papers on this topic, many different tests and conditions. But it's pretty well understood that uh, there is this process we call memory consolidation, where. Uh, the brain does something to rehearse and strengthen, strengthen whatever information learned during the day. And the current theory, uh, you know, in a very simplified fashion, is that uh, during the day we store information in the input campus uh, temporarily, and then at night, and you know, the details of this is is debatable. There are some people that say it in one way, other people say it in another way. I will use this uh, simplified explanation. It looks like there is some kind of information transfer from the hippocampus to the cortex. And then this memory, uh, you know, that is basically connections between neurons is being redistributed in the cortex. And the map, some kind of a map, some kind of representation of that memory that was uh, stored temporarily in the hippocampus is redistributed on the cortex. And, uh, and this, process that I just described uh, is mediated somehow by specific features that we observe during slow sleep. So for example, when the information is moved, it seems that it is associated with these very sharp ripples, that these are ripples that are, they are not observable from the cortex, so you will not be able to, uh, you know, from the scalp you will not be able to detect them using uh, EEG. But uh, when people uh, have uh, in, in inside their brain detect, uh, you know, uh, electrodes, because uh, maybe this is uh, an epilepsy study and, you know, they have uh, electrodes implanted, then you can actually observe them. Uh, and you observe them, uh, you know, in a very interesting pattern relatively to these other features, like the slow waves and the spindles. So the spindles, come from the thalamus, the slow waves are uh, in the cortex. The, ma the majority of the slow waves are uh, actually generating the prefrontal cortex. Uh, and then this uh, hippocampus uh, generated waves called sharp wave ripples. So, the, so this is once one hertz, so, uh, nine, 16 hertz, and then these very fast waves at 100 hertz. Uh, the, the way that they are, uh, um, let me see if I have uh, a graph here, a picture of it. Yeah, so basically, uh, this is how 
they are uh, related to each other in terms of uh, uh, you know, their, uh, their temporal uh, um, um, relationship. You see these big slow waves, right, at one hertz. And then at the peak of the slow waves, uh, you actually see nested inside there, on top of there, uh, the, sp the spindles. And then inside the spindle, uh, if, if, you are, if you have a, uh, in, you know, the information from uh, with electrodes that are actually implanted, uh, because you would not be able, like I say, you would not be able to see them on the scalp, then if you zoom in inside the spindles, you will see that at the bottom of, uh, of the, so basically the negative part of the oscillation in the spindles, you see this, the sharp ripples. So there is this nesting of different type of uh, um, brain waves uh, that uh, you know, it's, it seems very interesting and very important to understand. But there is this kind of orchestration of these, uh, um, these oscillations. And uh, there are different theories. One theory is that the reason we have this long oscillation is because uh, we probably want is a process where uh, the majority of the brain is participating. And uh, you know, if you have uh, some long, like if you have a slow oscillation like this, this means very long wave, uh, long waves. And so this means that these waves can create some kind of coherent pattern over large regions of the brain. Uh, and then you have these, uh, uh, these uh, spindles. There's some kind of gating mechanism for information because they are coming from the thalamus. So one of the main functions uh, is uh, to kind of gate uh, information that come from both sides. So basically it's almost like trying to keep the brain isolated from the external environment that, uh, while this uh, very important process of memory consolidation is happening. Then the uh, sharp ripples are actually the little bit of information. And this is, you know, it's, it's a very fascinating topic, but I don't know if there is much done in terms of, you know, how the memory is encoded in this sharp ripple, etc. But basically, you know, if one wanted to dig, this is where you will dig, you know, because this is, it looks like this is where uh, the information is moved or from the hippocampus to the, um, to the cortex. Um, the details, like I say, are uh, to be researched <laughs> by the next uh, PhD students. Uh, but anyway, so, um, this is you know, the state of the art, let's say, of uh, how we think this process happens. Uh, but it's very clear, you know, from the, let's say, zero order, let's call them like that, experiments, you know, where you do this experiment during the day, during the night, that something happens during so we sleep, and somehow these waves are uh, associated, are, are, are part of this uh, process. And so the question is, one of the questions that we wanted to explore was, are these uh, uh, waves uh, an indirect uh, phenomena in the sense that, you know, the, yes, we are associated with the process, but we are not actively responsible for the process, right? Uh, what they do exactly, we don't know. But what if we manipulated them? Like we, for example, we know that um, during aging, these uh, waves became smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, the reason why this happened is probably because there is a degradation of the circuits, you know, of the brain connections. And so it's an, uh, because of wear and tear, you know, and, uh, uh, and that is then is responsible in uh, uh, creating weaker slow waves. Uh, and these uh, weaker slow waves make you sleep uh, worse, that uh, probably creates more degradation in the brain. So it's kind of a vicious circle. So uh, over time, you see actually a decrease in the amplitude of this wave. And that is also very strongly correlated with cognitive decline. A lot of the cognitive decline that people experience due to aging is due to this decrease in the amplitude of the slow waves. So one valid question is, can I do something to actually modify the amplitude of the waves, of the, in particular the slow waves, because uh, there seems to be in this hierarchy, the higher up, right? So maybe if you modify them, everything else uh, gets also modified. Uh, and they are relatively easy to detect and uh, probably also to manipulate because uh, um, you know, they are in a range where uh, it's possible to do something you know, with 100 hertz, it's 
a little bit more complicated to manipulate these waves. Um, but is there anything that we can do to amplify the waves? And so this is where our, our research was focused. Um, and the people tried many different things. Like, uh, for example, one obvious candidate will be to use uh, transcranial magnetic uh, stimulation or um, you know, electrical currents. Uh, and uh, there was a seminal paper in 2006 where uh, uh, in Germany, they tried to actually to apply uh, alternating um, current. Um, you know, it was a, it, it, it was direct current, but you know they kind of slowly change the amplitude of the stimulation. Let's say like that, uh, and uh, and uh, this, the changing of the amp amplitude was uh, uh, in the range of uh, of a frequency of the slow waves, uh, and uh, we were able to sh to sh show that actually it was an amplification of the slow waves. Then uh, we had a paradigm where uh, there was a a stimulation night, and there was a, um, a, a night where a, uh, there was a sham stimulation you know, with a, the same setup, but uh, no amplification. Um, and they show that actually the memory was affected. But uh, the, these uh, typical tests that we use uh, um, showed a difference in uh, memory performance. Um, so we, where we, our work was 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 in trying to find something that was uh, a little bit easier to apply and also less invasive. And so we tried many different things. Uh, and what seemed to work, it's actually uh, sound. And uh, I will explain you that in a second. So um, let me see. I have many different slides. I want to uh, see if I can. For these only any of these lights is useful. So, um, so this is a slide that uh, is trying to show um, actually how you can use other type of stimulation, like for example, you can use uh, smell. So historically, this was actually one of the first experiment where they show that uh, you can do some kind of stimulation during the day and associate with the stimulation with some kind of task. Um, so, for example, maybe remembering phases, uh, you you show you you present an order only with uh, maybe fifty percent of uh, some some phases that people need to remember, uh, and then uh, you present the order during slow wave sleep. So, if you do it during other time, it doesn't work. But if you do it doing it during slow wave sleep. Uh, you present that order that was associated with uh, the particular learning experience. And then you test the person. Uh, we do much better in the you know, with the phases that were associated with the order. So but this was a, one of the earliest experiments where uh, people show that you can naturally manipulate uh, slow wave sleep to obtain some particular result in terms of memory. Um, here more of, about uh, the uh, nesting of the different frequencies. So this is an interesting uh, slide here on the left. Uh, so this is a very, also this was a seminal paper where uh, uh, what they did here, uh, you know, they implanted uh, electrodes inside our, uh, the brain of a rat. Uh, in particular, these are uh, place cells. And, uh, and what they saw that, uh, uh, you know, they let the, uh, the rat go through a labyrinth and so they, they were uh, uh, different uh, uh, markers in the landmarks in the labyrinth. Uh, and uh, when the rat went through this uh, landmark, some cells in the brain activated, right? And there was a very precise pattern with this. Uh, so this uh, on the y-axis, you see the cell number that was activated. So uh, it was kind of a recognizable pattern associated with uh, the rat learning or remembering the uh, setup of a labyrinth. And then during sleep, in particular during slow wave sleep, uh, they saw that the rat was basically repeating the same pattern. Uh, and it was uh, uniquely associated with uh, the learning experience. And, uh, and this uh, pattern was repeated many, many times during sleep, almost like if the rat was rehearsing the experience. Uh, and also what is very interesting is that it was every event was compacted in time. So it lasted like uh, 
so if, uh, for example, a particular event lasted uh, one second, it was reduced by a factor of five, let's say. It was much shorter. So it was kind of almost like fast forwarding the experience and then repeating it many, many times to consolidate your memory. Uh, as, as far as I, I am aware, there is no an equivalent experiment in humans uh, like this, but you know, we think that uh, it will be equivalent if we did such an experiment with your notes. Uh, it's probably much more, yeah, it's very relatively invasive experiment. So probably that is one of the reasons why, why we have not done this yet in humans. Um, okay. Um, all right. So another interesting thing uh, to observe is that uh, uh, when, uh, when you do experiments where you actually measure the uh, firing of the electrons, uh, these uh, uh, features in the slow waves are associated with these uh, firing patterns. So, for example, when you see these, the negative part of the oscillation, that is associated with uh, the hyperpolarization of the neurons. So, when, basically, when they are resting, then when you see the positive parts of the uh, slow wave oscillation, that they, you know, of course, when you uh, have these very large electrodes on the forehead, etc., there's no the activity of a single neurons, but millions, if not billions, of, of neurons. So, in, statistically, corresponds. You know, the, the positive part of the slow waves corresponds to the firing. Uh, so it's really two states, right? And we call them the up and down state. So the up state will be when the neurons fire. Then the down states is when the neurons are uh, there. Uh, Hyper, hyperpolarization state basically arresting. So I kind of, I don't know if it is a truth or a joke, but they say basically when you're in slow sleep, your the brain is half, for half a second is sleeping because it's resting. And then for half a second is doing something useful that is this firing. And in the firing is when the information is moved. Remember there is this nesting of uh, sharp ripples that are inside the spindles and the spindle are inside the positive part of a slow wave. So when they are firing. To me, this is very important to understand why our procedure works because uh, it turns out that, you know, when we did our experiments where uh, when we deliver the in impulse of sound that I described before, we, we try to do it at all the different places during the slow wave oscillation. And the only place where it works in a very, very a subtle way, very sensitive way, is during the up state. So if you are trying to do it during the down state, when the neurons are not talking, it doesn't work. Actually, you could even repress the amplitude of the slow waves. While you're, you're doing it during firing, uh, we see this amplification of the slow waves, but uh, um, and also the memory uh, effects, the, imp the improvement in memory. But this is very interesting. Uh, so in that, I, this is why I don't want to think about um, brain waves as real waves, at least of the slow waves. They are really a switching between two states, right? So you are, you are, uh, and it's a temporal switching. So it's a more like a rhythm. Uh, so there is some rhythm is important, uh, but it's not a real wave. It's not a continuous phenomenon. It's like a, a, a bipolar type of phenomenon. You, know, you have a down and the up state. Um, here, more of the, the same things. So with age, you basically see a deterioration of this orchestration between this, this different type of uh, uh, waves and brain regions. Uh, there is some deterioration in the networks, etc. So you start to see a uh, um, reduction in these orchestrations. So it, and then um, it manifested itself uh, in terms, you know, there was this study, for example, where uh, um, it, this was um, in Berkeley, I think, um, where uh, they show that uh, you know, there is a very big difference in uh, the location, uh, the amplitude, uh, the range of frequencies, a uh, very big difference between uh, young adults and uh, older adults. Um, you, you can see this graph, the, ampli the global amplitude, the, this is called uh, uh, slow wave activity. Basically, you're measuring the um, total amplitude of the waves or an average amplitude of the waves during the night. Uh, and you can see there is a huge difference between uh, uh, 
uh, young people or older people. Um, and this is a graph right? so that shows that. Uh, um, and no, 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 just so, and that, and you can see here the strong correlation, right, between the amplitude of the waves and memory performance. So, in this graph, you see the um, some kind of measure, right, of uh, global slow wave activity uh, based on the amplitude of the power of these slow waves and uh, memory performance on the y axis. So end up, and these two graphs are referring to the total activity and then you can, because most of the slow waves, are, like I say, they are, and you can see it from this graph, are produced in the prefrontal cortex, you can do the similar graph for the prefrontal cortex, and they are relatively similar. Um, the, other, the other aspects, uh, so this was another paper here, in this case, uh, uh, I apologize, I should have had like a title slides for the, for the study, but uh, it's actually done by, by the same people, in particular this uh, um, student. I mean, uh, he was like a Northwestern student. Most of my work was done at Northwestern, um, and this was a, a PhD from Northwestern. He moved to uh, Berkeley, so uh, this study was done at Berkeley. So in this case, what they studied, uh, not, uh, so first, uh, the previous study was mostly focused on amplitude uh, of the slow waves. And in this study, instead, they looked at uh, this uh, uh, temporal correlation between the different features. So, um, you know, it's a very interesting paper. It has a lot of details, but uh, the most important slides is this one, where you can see uh, if you look at the spindles and how the spindles are located relatively to the slow waves, uh, the, the tip of the spindle happens exactly there in the peak of the slow waves. This is exactly where we found out through our experimentation that uh, uh, this is where you want to deliver the pulse of sound exactly at that peak. Um, so part of uh, the IP of my technology is try to uh, identify this wave, follow these waves, uh, and then deliver the peak, the pulse at the exact time. So it's a very, is why I call it personalized. Uh, you cannot just do a uh, stimulation every second, for example. You have to follow the stochastic process that uh, is associated with the production of slow waves. Uh, and you have to follow every single wave and then deliver in a very surgical way the, the pulse. This is why you need uh, uh, to measure continuously the slow waves. Um, but uh, as you uh, age, you actually see uh, an uncoupling of these uh, uh, spindles relatively to the peak of the waves. And, uh, and actually how much of this uncoupling is present is correlated with forgetting. So uh, more, more uncoupling, worse is the performance of a subject in different memory tests. Uh, the two are uh, correlated with each other. So, um, so this is, these are to give you a background. So, but, uh, you know, basically, um, what uh, what we did. Uh, this was one of our uh, uh, first papers where uh, uh, this is our, our our group at uh, Northwestern uh, University, where I did uh, most of the R and D behind this technology. Um, we uh, developed this system that uh, basically follows the waves, and when I say follow. Uh, what we do is basically a closed loop type of stimulation. We detect, uh, first of all, we detect, the algo is able to detect that we are in slow sleep, differently from other stages. So we don't stimulate during the other stages. We only stimulate during slow sleep. And that is important because most people are not even uh, aware that uh, there is a background sound because it's the most unconscious part of uh, sleep and unless somebody is shaking you or screaming at you, you're not going to wake up. These are very, very soft uh, uh, sounds. Most of the time we ask our subjects, did you hear any sound? Did you hear anything? And most people say, no, you know, they are not aware of it, they were nothing, that something was happening. Um, and, uh, uh, and so when uh, slow sleep is detected, we actually use this uh, algorithm 
is called a, a phase lock algorithm, um, a phase lock loop. It's actually something that is used uh, in many different fields of engineering. I think, I think it was invented in the 60s. Uh, and uh, it's an algorithm that allows you basically measures. Um, so usually mathematics, maybe some of you are familiar, right? You do a Nilbert transform, right? So you do a Nilbert transform that allows you uh, if you uh, to calculate the phase of uh, some kind of uh, periodic phenomena, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can determine. So if, for example, you want to detect the peak, um, you could use an Hilbert transform and the Hilbert transform will tell you the phase. But uh, the problem with the Hilbert transform, it is something that uh, can be done offline uh, because you need information from the past and the future to do an Hilbert transform. But uh, uh, so that would not work if you are trying to do uh, online application like this one, right? You want to detect the peak and then deliver the pulse. You don't want to have uh, past the future information because you don't have it future information when you're trying to do uh, online stimulation. Uh, so you have to come up with something else. And uh, uh, but something else, you know, as that, this is where my physicist background helped because I, I was aware of this phase lock loop. And when I was working with this uh, uh, project, I immediately understood, okay, we need to use a phase lock loop. Now, I don't say that is the only way to do it, uh, but uh, it's actually works very well. Now, you can take the phase lock loop and then you need to modify it and you need to make it work for uh, this particular application. Uh, this is why we have IP, right? It, even if a phase lock loop is, is an existing technology, our modification was good enough, was uh, big enough to actually grant, it, grant our own patent uh, on, on, in this field. But uh, you can see the effect, right? So it's something, this is a phase lock loop is, a, is an algorithm that allows you, so you have a, like a reference clock. Uh, so in, for example, I could start with a sine wave that is oscillating at, uh, the typical oscillation of this subject. So you measure offline, um, not offline, but you know you have a, a reference night where uh, you collect data, and then uh, you know that this person is going to have a, um, a certain given range of uh, delta oscillation, and maybe they, domin they have a dominant uh, peak or some somewhere. And then use that as the reference clock, and then during the night uh, you're uh, checking the difference continuously in a phase between the slow wave oscillations and uh, uh, this reference clock. And then you are trying to correct continuously with a, you know, a, a given uh, rate of correction, uh, this difference in phase. And, the, and this uh, graph here on the right shows you uh, the result, right? So the blue line is uh, uh, the algorithm, right? Is uh, the um, on, on, continuous online uh, evaluation of a um, of a phase of a in this case amplitude, but you know you can convert the phase into an amplitude. Uh, is measured in microvolts, so you can produce basically a blue curve like that. And, uh, and then, because you control that, you know when you are reaching the peak. Now, we don't do the stimulation of a peak. Um, because there are always uh, some delays, right? The, it takes time for the uh, for, for the sound signal to reach the cortex, but also there are electronic delays, you know. So basically, there is a delay between when you detect the signal to actually when you deliver the sound pulse. So we correct for that, and so you notice here you know, these magenta uh, lines where we deliver the sound. We do it on purpose to do it just slightly before. The peak because then the sound will reach the peak, uh, and uh, and there is a we measure the effect. This is why everything is very uh, adaptive because we measure continuously the effect of these pulses in the brain. By uh, so we do it with the way we do that. We have this uh, um, protocol where uh, uh, we have uh, times where we don't do uh, the stimulation. So it's a uh, now, why five instead of six or seven? It's just playing around with things. You know, we are still trying to uh, discover what is optimal 
Uh, but right now, the current protocol is uh, to wait for five oscillations. Also, because of this uh, helps with uh, habituation, you know, because if you do it continuously, probably the, uh, the brain will habituate. So we, we do we take a pause. So we take a pause, five um, oscillations, then we apply the stimulation for uh, five. Uh, so we have our own uh, block, you can call it. Then we have a, an off block. And then we can measure continuously the effect of our stimulation. And then we adapt, right, in terms of where we want to deliver the pulses or uh, so because it's basically an, an online measurement of the delay. Um, and uh, how, how strong the pulse is, right, so we can change the uh, amplitude of the sound. So everything it tri tries to be as adaptive as possible. Now, uh, so here you, you see some results of uh, what, uh, what happens if you're comparing uh, the stimulation versus the sham. Uh, you can see that uh, during this day, uh, this is interesting because if you compare sham, a sham night, right? So we have a, we alternate uh, randomly between a, a simulation night and a sham night. So we can see the results in particular in memory. So it's an interesting because yes, there are differences between the stimulation and the sham night, but sometimes they go opposite of what you will think. Like for example, from in this particular subject, right? You see that, uh, uh, so this is kind of a, almost like an ERP type of uh, graph, right? So where you average many, many of these uh, stimulations, uh, you can see that uh, the amplitude seems to be bigger during the sham, right? So what, what is going on there? Well, uh, it turns out with this difference between amplitude in the steam versus sham, it, it is not what correlates with uh, the memory improvement. What correlates with the memory improvement is what you see on the right. So you, now if you take uh, the power, the total power of the slow waves during uh, these on blocks versus the uh, off, so the red curve, is the on block and the blue curve, the black curve is the off blocks. You can see there is much more power during the on blocks. And, and it's uh, both in the delta region, clearly, right? And not much at all the beta region, but it's nice because you are not stimulating higher frequencies um, that could wake up the subjects. You see some in. Well, increase also indirectly by stimulating the slow waves in the spindle region here in the around this 11 kind of bump here, 11 hertz bump. And now it turns out that if you sum all the power in the between zero to four and you take the ratio between the total power in this region over the uh, for the on blocks versus the off blocks, that is what correlates. So we call it the change in slow wave activity, not between sham and the stimulation, but within the same night. So within the same night, if you take this block on and blocks off, and uh, you measure that change in amplitude, then that correlates with uh, the moment improvement. So in this study is a small group, but actually the signal is so strong that it actually makes our case even better because uh, um, uh, it, it, I calculated what is the power, you know, for uh, that comes out of the study. So you will get statistical significance only with five subjects. Um, but we had, a, I think, we had a, like sixteen in this experiment, and uh, and you can see uh, there is a very clear correlation between. Uh, uh, like now, in I tell you the truth. If, if I presented this graph to physicists, they will laugh at me. Okay, most of them will say this. Is Nothing, uh, but you know, for uh, for uh, a neuroscience type of study, the you know, physiology type of study, it's statistically significant. Uh, you know, with a p of zero point zero eighteen. Uh, of course, right? We would like to have many more, and after this, we actually tested hundreds of subjects, and we see the same pattern. But this was one of our, our first papers where we were able to show that there is a correlation between our stimulation and uh, uh, improvement. In memory, uh, and it worked for almost all the subjects. So only two uh, didn't show a response. 
some some showed a very uh, big response, uh, but it was pretty consistent. And then two didn't. Now we even think that these two subjects, because these were uh, uh, 60 years and older, because we wanted to focus on older people and see if we could help them uh, with uh, the stimulation. Uh, and we think that these two subjects didn't even hear the sound, you know, because of being older, because we went back and we did some acoustic uh, um, test um, to see how well everybody was uh, hearing. And this seemed to be the subject that had uh, the strongest problem. So even if a system is adaptive, uh, uh, you know, it's difficult to work with people that cannot hear sound. Um, but, you know, even, even in that case, um, it seems to work pretty well. Anyway, I know that we are running out of time. Just give me a couple of minutes. I want to show you uh, how the device looks like. Uh, <coughs> this is an early prototype right now. Uh, we are funded, uh, we have this study, uh, you know, funded by the Institute of Aging. So um, it's a, a proper deep wave studies. Uh, my left uh, uh, Northwest end to focus on the company and we got the uh, SBR grant. And so this is where we are right now. We're doing this study to type, type, kind of replicate whatever we did in the lab using wearables because, you know, what we did in the lab was using uh, very expensive uh, equipment. Uh, uh, it was uh, all wired. It didn't have. A, it was not wearable. Uh, but now we want to uh, miniaturize the, the uh, equipment and make something that looks like this. Of course, you know the final factor will look much better. We are working with this company called Cognonics. It's here in town. Probably you guys are familiar with it. And so uh, the idea is to develop a device like this that uh, will also have, a, you know, headphones. Um, like some kind of flat electrodes that are comfort comfortable for sleep. And, uh, uh, and we are uh, trying to show that we can do these using a setup like this. You know. So this is where the company is at, at the moment. Um, anyway, so there are many other things that uh, I, I, I can talk about. And you know, we had to, actually had a DARPA grant at a certain point where uh, we were able to go much deeper in terms of understanding the phenomena, you know, trying different um, applications like learning a language, for example, and showing that the device can be used for that. Uh, we had a positive uh, uh, results. We got a lot of, uh, so these are some of the uh, journals where we publish, but we also got a lot of coverage, you know, from different, uh, media. Uh, anyway, there was a, uh, even a little ABC uh, you know, segment, 10, 15 minutes, we talked about us, our study. Uh, many, many different applications for slow sleep. Uh, um, yeah, like this, I want to spend, I'm going to end here. Uh, so, you know, given the COVID situation, actually, uh, the brain learns about, you know, it can is a resetting and is giving instruction to the immune system. Actually, there are, there are several papers that are coming out exactly dealing with slow sleep. And uh, uh, this group in Germany use uh, our uh, protocol um, to actually stimulate subjects during uh, sleep. And then they measure all kinds of uh, biomarker associated with uh, the immune response. And they show that uh, they, all of them went uh, uh, in the right direction. They improved. Uh, so this could be another possible application to make the immune system more robust by stimulating people uh, during sleep uh, with this very non-invasive uh, approach. Anyway, so I'm, I'm stopping here. Uh, and uh, let me know if you have any questions or if we are even have time for questions. But I think, sorry if I went uh, six minutes over. I think you know that that doesn't matter. Like uh, we still have some time for uh, some questions, so please ask your question directly, or you can write them on the chat. I'm not sure I see the chat. <laughs> let me see. I will let you know if something pops up in the chat. Okay. Anyone has uh, any questions?
from the audience. Uh, yes, a question. Uh, very interesting work, uh, Giovanni. Um, so, so are you playing with the phase between acoustic stimulation and and the slow wave, um, the slow waves that you identified? Because uh, um, I think you suggested that you're on the line with the peak, but so given your phase lock loop, you can play with, you can adjust the phase too, right? And you may find that uh, different a different phase may give you more effective uh, uh, closed loop um, uh, effects, right? Yeah, so uh, we did do a study where uh, uh, we did like a circular histogram of a response. Uh, I don't have it, but uh, it's a very interesting graph. But imagine this uh, circular histogram where uh, I measure for uh, every phase. Uh, in that case, we measure the um, average amplitude you know, of on versus off. Because on versus off, this is also a very interesting thing. It turns out that this this uh, redistribution in a sense, because there are much less uh, slow waves during these blocks off for some reason. Um, and uh, they uh, almost like there is a budget, right? There is a, a given budget and all the slow waves up and during the own blocks. Uh, so we did uh, uh, this uh, ratio uh, versus the phase. And you can see that there is a very narrow region where the system responds very strongly. And if you do it the opposite during the down state, actually the slow waves became smaller. So actually that could be used, uh, stimulating during the down state could be used if you want to repress slow waves. Uh, there are some studies that show that at least temporarily for people that with depression. It, uh, this is why people that uh, with depression sometimes don't, it's actually good for them not to sleep. You know, like if they you know, jump a night or something, they feel better the day after. Uh, not, you know, I don't know if it is why, but it could be a reason. But if, if you use this uh, device and you then try to repress the slow waves, you know, it would be interesting to see if that helps at least momentarily, let's say, uh, with uh, depression. Um, so there are, yeah, I'm very interested in what stimulating at different phases does. I don't know if you were suggesting it to do it in a more dynamic way and see if that has uh, some interesting effect. Yes. Well, um, well so I, I think I, you're saying that basically the, the most effective, um, the, the greatest effect is, is when you do this at the peak at, on the, uh, so zero phase, uh, that, right? Right, exactly. And uh, I, it would be interesting, and you know, mostly because I think it has to do with the fact that this is when the neurons are firing. You know, uh, probably if you do it uh, in the down state, uh, the neurons are hyperpolarized, so they don't, uh, they are not uh, eager to fire. You know, so it's more difficult to make yeah. them fire anything. But, well, yeah, what was the thing is there's also there's other delays in in the in the loop, right? Because, um, yeah. um, and so when you stimulate acoustically, there is time for that to propagate and, and make it into um, right. those cortical regions right now. Yeah, but it is a very, it's a very interesting protocol, you know, because I think almost, you know, it's so inexpensive to do such a thing, right? It, it's a very relatively easy equipment. It's a very mm -hmm. non-invasive way. Yeah. The fact you get such a great response is a, is that in a sense even a way of a, uh, it's not just about the memory, but uh, it's a yeah. way of uh, testing a system, right? You're yeah. testing a system uh, in a stressful way, in a sense, you know, yeah. and uh, maybe could be used even as a diagnostic tool, you know, because uh, how different uh, group with different condition responds to the stimulation could be a very, because uh, most of the time you do it in a passive way. This is also to, uh, to link with what uh, you were telling me about this uh, Philip Law Corporation, right? Because one of the things we wanted to do was this uh, idea of, re of recording people's EEG over a long period of time, because we don't have that information. There is no, there are no ba uh, data banks of uh, people sleep over days, weeks, months, years, right? And it could be really interesting because maybe monitoring uh, the brain activity during sleep over a long period of time could be predictive of different mental illnesses, maybe Alzheimer, uh, maybe even cardiovascular diseases because there is a very strong association in your sleep. So 
uh, but you know, you do it in a passive way, but if you do it in a stressful way, like this one, where you are stressing the system to do something and, and to see how, how the system responds, so this could be actually more, uh, you know, another tool to consider in term, even in terms of diagnostics. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just, so in, in, in that one sort of a question about many groups, uh, uh, by John. Uh, hi, John. Yeah, it's actually, I was very surprised because uh, uh, just after, you know, maybe one year after our paper, there is this big conference uh, about sleep every year, you know, uh, where uh, all the scholars, but also medical doctors in the field come. And there was an entire section dedicated just one year after we published our paper to this <laughs> topic, an entire section. Uh, and uh, And actually, it's the first time in my life where I see people outside a room waiting for a talk, you know, in a conference. Like actually they had to close the door because there were too many people that wanted to join. Uh, and so it, it became a, almost like a new field in neuroscience in a certain sense. Uh, and, uh, and right now, if I, I, if I am aware of, there are at least uh, maybe six different groups around uh, um, the world. Uh, one of the most active is this uh, Tubingen uh, group uh, that published that immune system paper. Uh, you know, I know that is a uh, university of, I don't know if you guys know, Giulio Tononi is uh, um, an expert in uh, uh, consciousness, but also uh, sleep. Uh, this is University of uh, Wisconsin, Madison. Um, yeah, it's becoming a, a very uh, popular field of studies because it, it, it's a very easy way uh, to uh, get the brain to react to something and you can measure it and you see these very easy uh, physiological results like memory, for example. Um, we did a study where we measure um, metabolism. We, oh, you know, in fact, actually in my paper, uh, so they, a very strong link between metabolism and the slow sleep. Like uh, there it was a University of Chicago study where they actually repressed uh, slow sleep. They did it in a very primitive way by basically blasting these sounds uh, in the room and they repressed uh, slow sleep. And uh, let me see if I can show you the slide it, it, if we still have time. Uh, and uh, it was a really dramatic of a result because uh, after a few days, like these were uh, young people, I, I saw a, a 15 minute segment from ABC and uh, uh, and uh, <laughs> it was funny because of the interviewer was there when they blasted the sound and uh, um, and it was so loud that you know, even scared the interviewer. And uh, you know, she, she's a famous uh, ABC, journalist, I don't remember her name, but you know, I, everybody knows her. Um, and, uh, um, and the person, because he was a young person, right? Probably an older guy will have woke up, but this, older, this young person didn't wake up. <laughs> uh, and the sound was like, you know, very loud. And so these are, every time a person went in slow way sleep, they blasted the sound and they didn't wake them up, but brought them down to a lower uh, non-REM stage. And after three or four days of this hell, the people were interviewed and they were saying, I don't know what is happening to me. I, I slept eight hours, but I feel like crap, right? I don't know what is going on here. And, uh, and then they measure all these, uh, these uh, biomarkers, right? You know, like uh, insulin levels, etc. And they look like pre-diabetics. And these were perfectly healthy subjects. So it's incredible how slow sleep has this impact on health, you know, the immune system, metabolism, memory, and then it's easily manipulated by something like sound. Oh, and you remember I was telling you in the beginning of the lecture that uh, there is a, an interesting link between this idea of why we sleep, right, and then what exactly we do and why it works. So my there was actually a paper published by University of Wisconsin Madison by that group with uh, Giulio Tononi, where they actually offer a theory of what is going on. And I, I had a, I work at the University of Wisconsin Madison, so actually it was kind of my idea, and they 
publish a paper around it, but it's okay. Um, you know, science, we are, it's important that science progresses. Uh, now who is credit, but it's very cool idea because basically what happens, there is a, a there is, you know, everybody's familiar with the normal pathway that uh, uh, sound is from information is sent to, you know, the thalamus, and then it goes to the cortex where it's processed, etc. right? There is a, a, another alternative pathways that it's bypassing the thalamus and it goes directly to the cortex. The only role of that pathway, that uh, um, pathway that goes from the uh, audio processing region of the brain to the cortex is to alert the brain of danger during sleep. So basically the idea is that, you know, we spend eight hours sleeping and it's a very dangerous thing, right? Uh, not for humans because we sleep in, in, uh, in bedrooms, but, you know, even for us when we were in the savannah, but, you know, for the majority of organism, it's very dangerous. So the brain came up with this uh, alert system that uh, is able to recognize different type of sounds. And what, so basically, when we did that, these early experiments where uh, uh, they put electrodes inside of patients with uh, epilepsy, and so they could monitor them around 24 hours, they noticed that sometime when a nurse would knock on the door, there was an immediate response in the EG. And it was like a, a negative V shape. So there is a, a name for this feature, it's called a K complex. And this K complex are basically a way for the brain to say, oh guys, you know, to the neurons, <laughs> go rest, you know, stay in the, in the hyperpolarized, hyperpolarized state, but something is happening. So I'm, I'm still looking around to see what happens next. So if a signal becomes louder and louder, you will wake up. If uh, there is a background noise like crickets, you will not. So basically, I think we are hijacking somehow this mechanism. So instead of stimulating from outside with some electrodes, you know, something that is invasive, but also not very specific, right? We are using something that is already there and we are hijacking it and uh, by stimulating during slow sleep, we are playing around with this activation, the activation mechanism and making the brain do what we want, right? In this case, it's uh, amplifying these waves. So it's a, it's a very interesting approach. And, uh, um, and I, Nature published a paper sometime. Do you remember that study from, I think it was from MIT, where they use uh, light to actually clean uh, the brain from, uh, um, beta amyloids, etc. right? They use flashes of light at 40 hertz. You remember the study? Um, anybody? Um, and uh, it was published on, in Nature. And then uh, they had an editorial. And the entire editorial was, oh, there is this new, you know, tendency in neuroscience. There are different groups that are coming up with these very non-invasive approaches to, uh, you know, to neuroscience, both in terms of studying the brain, but also having interesting uh, effects, you know, um, that are all based on non-invasive approaches. And, uh, and that editorial actually mentioned our work uh, in this, you know, was what we did with the sound was one of the approaches that we mentioned. But there are several others that are using simple things like these, flashes of lights, etc., to actually um, you know, both investigating, but also getting the basically uh, non-pharmacological interventions, you know, that is uh, quite interesting. Thank you. There's a question from- Yeah, let me see, I saw Dr. another question. So um, how do you find the optimal volume for the auditory stimulation? Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, exactly, so you have to imagine uh, you will not want to be loud such a subject with caps, exactly. So <clears throat> I re you remember we do, so the first thing we do uh, when the subject comes to the lab uh, and you know when we do this at home with our uh, device, we, we, our idea is that the subject will we'll have a little test, uh, uh, maybe 
uh, every few days or maybe even before every uh, time that the subject uses the device. But uh, basically, uh, sounds are being presented to you. Uh, and, uh, you know, then we measure that uh, uh, physiological response. Um, and uh, sometimes we actually ask the subject to change uh, uh, the sound level until their uh, hearing threshold. So we present different sound and then the subject can change, the, you know, using some kind of dial on the screen. Right now, our um, current setup with the, uh, our uh, prototype is that we use an iPad. So you can change the, your, the sound while I'm presenting these beeps, the same beeps that we're going to use uh, to stimulate you um, until basically uh, you don't hear them anymore on, on, the, on the threshold of that. Uh, so that we use, we use that as our uh, reference point. And then uh, we have this protocol where uh, at night, when we start with stimulation, we, we start with sounds that are uh, slightly below that threshold. Uh, and then little by little, we measure, we remember I told you there are these on and off blocks. We can see if there is a, an effect. If there is not an effect, we amplify the sound. We go a little bit higher in volume. And then uh, until we get uh, enough of a response, we don't want to go too much higher. At the same time, we also monitor alpha and beta, uh, because if we see a change in alpha and beta, probably that means the subject is going to wake up. So we, we actually have a little bit more sophisticated algorithm than that. We kind of can predict from the quality of the alpha and beta uh, EG if the person is going to wake up. So before they wake up, if we see some increase in alpha and beta activity, we are going down with the volume. So it's a very adaptive system that actually monitor the sound level. So yeah, very good question. Is a at the end emphasizes as a part of our technology, but it's it is it's a very important component to do to do this kind of monitoring. Um, and in fact, actually, we have a protocol where. Uh, if a alpha and beta activity goes above a certain threshold, we actually suspend the stimulation for a few seconds, you know, up to a minute, just to avoid that the subject wake up. Because, yeah, that, that is probably one of the biggest problems. You, you do want to avoid the subject to wake up because uh, you will be you know, much worse if you do that. If you do that. So the first thing you, you, don't want, you want to avoid is to be disrupted, you know, with the uh, sleep of the subject. Now, the other question is, uh, are you presenting sound binaurally? No, uh, because uh, uh, first of all, it turns out that the brain cannot process binaural sound, right, during uh, slow sleep, because basically binaural sounds is when you're presenting two high frequency sounds uh, 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 on, in the di different years, right? And then let's say I have a, a thousand hertz sound in one year, a thousand and ten hertz, then the brain somehow takes this information, takes the difference, and it thinks that it's dealing with a sound that is 10 hertz. Uh, and that is called binaural uh, sounds or wave or whatever. Um, I don't, I'm not, a, 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 I'm very skeptical. I know that there are some people that did studies using binaural sounds and they claim that it works, but uh, um, there are reasons why, um, I think it's more of a scam than anything else. Uh, the way we, you know, the main, the main problem with uh, binaural sounds trying to solve is that brain activity is much lower in terms of frequency range than the typical sounds, right? Sounds uh, that are audible to human beings are uh, in the range of, you know, you can hear lower than that, but typically from a few hundred hertz to 10,000, or tens of thousands of hertz. And that is outside the brain frequency range, right? So how can you use this very high frequency sound to stimulate certain frequency? Well, you know, the solution was take the difference between two high frequency sounds and the brain interprets them, this interesting phenomena uh, of, the, of the binaural sounds. But you can do it in another way that is giving pulses, right? So you can have a, a very short, like we do it, uh, a short burst, and if you do it every second, then here you solve the problem of having 
uh, temporal uh, stimulation that is in the range of the frequencies of the brain that we want to stimulate. So this is why we do it in that way. In addition to that, I think frequency is not the way to go. It's phase. So is you know our stimulation doesn't have a frequency because we do it following each single wave. And uh, if you measure the time between the peaks, it's uh, that is what I was telling you before. I actually ask that question to neuroscientists. Do we have information about that? Uh, and there is not a single paper that publish an histogram of the, free, the time between the peaks. It's, it's a log normal curve with a long, long tail, uh, heavy tail. And so it's a stochastic chaotic process, right? This is why physicists like to see these histograms because we can kind of, from the shape of a histogram uh, of a distribution, we can uh, infer something about the process that created that this uh, uh, phenomena. Uh, and so if you have a long tail like that, it means that you know, some kind of uh, nonlinear, chaotic uh, um, product type of a, of a phenomena, instead of being uh, additive, um, it's a multiplicative process. And so frequency is meaningless, you know, in a sense. What is important here is the phase, because I, I can show you these are two uh, two uh, important physiological events, right? You have the hyperpolarized uh, hyper state when the neurons are resting, and then there is this firing. So you want to focus on when to deliver the pulse, uh, and that has to do with phase. It's not uh, really the, a frequency. Uh, so yeah, this is why we do it in this way. So we don't do it by now. We It's a 50 millisecond pink noise, why is pink noise versus anything else? I don't think it matters because it's so short, it's 50 milliseconds. Now why 50 milliseconds versus 100 milliseconds? Because there are a million things to test <laughs> and we just played with some of them. So if it would be very interesting, I'm looking for people who want to collaborate in, in studies like this because there are so many things to explore, right? What is the optimal duration of a sound to be uh, all uh, uh, equally uh, presented, or maybe you can change the duration according to you know some parameters. You know, it's it, it's uh, so many things need to be explored because it's a new field. You know, so we don't know what is optimal. Uh, see another question: Does stimulating a suboptimal phase cause memory deficit? Um, in, in, in they did an experiment, there is a paper, again, from this Tubingen group that is called uh, Timing Matters. And what they did, they did compare uh, doing the stimulation using a closed loop like we do, and then doing it at regular time, so every second, for example. And they show that some, it's kind of interesting and strange, the amplitude of the waves increase when uh, you do it uh, in the one second paradigm, right? If you present the stimulation a very regular interval, but memory was not affected. So memory didn't improve. It only improved when you do it in this uh, closed loop stimulation. Uh, they didn't see a decrease of the memory, but they didn't see an improvement. So uh, I don't know. Uh, it's, it seems that the closed loop stimulation is very important. And I don't know of any experiment where they show that there was a decrease in memory. I, I, don't, I don't think that was observed. But people publish papers all the time on, on this subject. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to keep updated, but I, I don't know. It would be interesting to find a way of uh, uh, targeting. So the other, the other thing, so I, if I have a one minute, I want to tell you something else. Um, so we got this very large DARPA grant, right? It was uh, several million dollars. And uh, part of the, so the, the main proposal was to actually combine two different uh, uh, technologies, if you want to call it, or techniques. Uh, one of it, uh, actually Northwestern, uh, this is with uh, Professor Paller. Uh, he's a kind of world expert of uh, another related phenomena. And uh, that phenomenon is called target memory reactivation. And it consists of these. You during the day, 
you have some learning experience. So let's imagine you're learning Chinese. Every time you learn Chinese, I present a different sound. You know, it could be, uh, you know, uh, the, the sound of a cat, a bell, or, you know, maybe even a specific tone in a certain frequency range or like a little short piece of music or whatever, you know? So I tag every learning experience with a particular sound. Then at night, during the way sleep, I replay the sounds. Because uh, your brain made this association between uh, the sound and what you were learning, the, uh, the brain will recall the entire memory, including uh, what you were trying to learn. And it will try to um, consolidate that memory. And actually, again, it seems uh, almost like it does it on a budget because you can learn just a certain number of things and it turns out that maybe other things are not learned or even forgotten. So, but, you know, most of the things that we learn during the day are useless. <laughs> uh, but if you can focus on things you want to learn, like, you know, maybe a language that you're trying to learn, you can emphasize this one. So what we propose to DARPA, because we were focused on these uh, different non-invasive approaches to improve uh, the soldier performance, you know, in, uh, in different cognitive tasks. Uh, and so we, it was a very interesting grant because uh, first of all, we combined these two technology, the uh, memory consolidation improvement by amplifying the waves, but uh, also during the stimulation, we also uh, did uh, this memory targeted uh, reactivation. And, uh, and we, you know, you know, try to do it only with the target memory reactivation only with uh, the stimulation and both, and both works better. Uh, so if you can tag certain memories and then amplify your moment memory consolidation process, it's very powerful. Like um, we, we show that uh, people could learn languages faster. Um, we did a task where people needed to learn uh, some motor, motor task, like uh, how to manipulate a, a complicated uh, military radio, uh, we did a task where people were in a labyrinth, uh, you know, to be, you know, maybe a, comp a compound, you know, where soldiers needed to go for a mission and they had to memorize the layout. So we did a lot of, uh, I liked that grant because it was all about very practical application. It was not like an abstract uh, word recall uh, test. It was uh, like, okay, can you use it for actually very practical uh, daily kind of experience type of applications and uh, almost everywhere it was a positive result. You know, so it, again, it, it seems to work very well. Um, and uh, it has a mm, mm, daily life implication. Now we, uh, with um, our grant that we have right now, we are a focus on Alzheimer. Uh, so we are working with these uh, uh, MCI subjects, you know, mild cognitive impairment, the early stages uh, of Alzheimer. And uh, again, the task will be there, can we improve the daily life of people by doing stimulation, the stimulation, you know, maybe slowing down the cognitive decline. Um, so, yeah. Well, thank you, Giovanni. Oh, it's my pleasure, it's my pleasure. Very nice. Uh... Thank you to everybody. Uh, and uh, if you want to give my information and I'm looking for, uh, you know, having a little bit more uh, uh, interaction with the local community of neuroscientists. So if you think that uh, anything I say is uh, relevant for uh, what you're doing and uh, you're looking for any type of collaboration, let me know. You can contact me privately. Okay, I hope people will. Thank you. So thank you again, and uh, yeah, I'll send you the link for the for the talk, like on the our uh, YouTube channel for INC. Perfect. So you can share it with uh, whoever you want. Thank you, guys. Thank Thanks you again. Bye bye. Bye.